Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 5528. That's 1 866 820 KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hi, this is Beach, and I'm in for Jen Solis today. She's on the road with Kurt in Colorado, beautiful Colorado. So, she'll be coming to us live in a little while with a live report from Colorado. Today with me, again today, is Mark Tabeek, our uh, friendly attorney from California, who is, is, I think he's going to become a Nevada attorney. On the, He's here so much. Well, Welcome. I'm still filling in uh, for uh, Mike McAuliffe while he's on hiatus. All right, terrific, terrific. Well, we'll have just a little bit of local news uh, about the movement and things that are going on. Of course, last, last uh, Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock, we... North Las Vegas had their town hall, and it was quite a turnout, I understand. And uh, I think if North Las Vegas uh, wants to save some money and pay some bills, I think this is one thing they need to do. How about you, Mark? Well, there's a concern uh, in any uh, number of municipalities across the nation, and particularly in North Las Vegas, about funding for public services, such as libraries and parks, not to mention first responders, such as Uh, legitimate law enforcement and firefighters. So uh, any uh, source of revenue uh, is a welcome source of revenue to such towns, and I think North Las Vegas sees the potential. All righty, yes. And, uh, and of course, I think Las Vegas does also. I'm real proud of what the county's been doing as far as plugging along. I know they've made some mistakes, and sometimes people don't like all the things they've done, but I'm real proud of Jackie and the county and all the effort that they've done and i hope that the city of north las vegas and las vegas get off their duffs and uh, get busy and let's uh let's get this thing done and run this ball from here to heaven well i'm pleased to uh, note that the uh, city of las vegas has amended its ordinance to drop the uh well just shall we say extreme fee structure for mm. applications that uh, seemed to my eye designed to uh, chase away anybody that didn't already have a lock on the process. So they've reevaluated that. My understanding mm. uh, from the sources I've talked to is that they're seeking a fee structure more consonant with the state's fee structure, at least as far as the application process goes. Mm. Uh, and then we'll see how that plays out. Mm, that's really good. I think we're starting to affect a lot of people. I've uh, been monitoring the news, of course for the weekend uh, listeners. And I noticed that California is getting a little excited because uh, they're watching Nevada. A lot of states are watching Nevada. They see this model coming together. It's a statewide model. And that, that is really something that a lot of states are very, very interested in. So uh, uh, in local news, Bill, we do have this Friday, first Friday coming up this week. And we're going to have our booth back out over by the Artifist. So we'd like all the locals and the visitors to Las Vegas to come by and visit the weekend booth this, this first Friday. And then just after that, the following Saturday, our second Saturday of the month, is Patients First, which is a great introductory for uh, new patients and people interested in medical cannabis to come out to Coffee, Bean, and Tea across from the UNLV at 2 o'clock on the second Saturday of the month. Um, We have a little bit of national news, and of course, Colorado being in the news, and one of the things that we have is we have our roaming reporters Jen and Kurt, and uh, Colorado seems to be uh, enjoying legal pot, and I think what we can do is talk to Jen and Kurt. Colorado enjoys legal cannabis, (laughs) but uh, unless you live in Denver or Pueblo or somewhere that that has uh, recreational, you can't buy it. My parents live in Colorado Springs, and they don't have any legal cannabis here um, for non-patients. They don't have any recreational adult use here in Colorado Springs. Um, Colorado Springs did bring their town out of bankruptcy, though, with uh, medical cannabis. So they're, they're, 
town was in bankruptcy, and then once they introduced the medical cannabis and the medical cannabis shops, in less than six t- months, their town was in the black. Um, uh, one of my friends, Tennessee Tipton, also has been up in Denver, and um, he's he's trying to get PTSD as a qualifying condition here in Colorado. Uh, so that fight's going on up in Denver, and um, he, he's been testifying for the past two days about this, and he's been sending me text after text, um, you know, talking about, you know, what the what the holdups are, and, the, and that people are um, major, for the most part, people are for this, but they they are saying that they have to have a, you know, a, a definite diagnosis of PTSD to, to be put on the program uh, here in Colorado. Uh, the, the major difference in Colorado between recreational and medical use is that Colorado charges a lot in taxes for recreational use, where they don't charge a lot for the medical use. Um, hmm. And that's about all, other than it's cold and snowing today. <laughs> well, Jen, I, I appreciate you bringing up that point, because I've often wondered, as this uh, debate has rolled on and the changes in the laws have come, uh, how the legalization for adult general consumption, uh, also known as recreational, uh, might impact the medical end of uh, legal cannabis. And uh, what, what do you see there? You just mentioned something uh, that is important, that uh, it seems to be a lot less expensive if, if you have a medical basis for it. Do you see any other differences there uh, as, uh, as it's playing out on the ground in Colorado with respect to uh, general legalized cannabis versus medical cannabis? Just beyond the beyond the municipalities, just not wanting it in their in their towns. Uh, a lot of them fought vehemently against it, uh, such as Colorado Springs and Manitou um, Manitou Springs. They they fought against recreational, and but they have there are dispensaries on almost every corner here um, for for medical. And we, you know, we go by them, and, and we're looking and stuff, and it doesn't look like they're exceptionally busy. Um, I think that's because there are just so many of them. Well, that could but be I supply think- and demand. If you have a really, really good supply, then you don't have to wait in line for your demand. Yeah, it's interesting because... Well, and the other thing the other thing that I did note is that, I mean, we only went to one shop, but... The quality of their of their medicine wasn't any better, and as a matter of fact, it was a lot worse than what I'm used to. But then again, we grow our own at home, so you know we have top quality stuff, I guess. <laughs> so I guess I'm a bit spoiled growing my stuff at home. You know, I went into the dispensary and I thought, "Ooh, kid in a candy store," and I thought I was all pumped up, and then I kind of smelled a couple of different ones. Then I was just like, you know what, I think I'm just going to buy it just to say that I did buy it recreationally, just as a, a hoot, you know, and a giggle or whatever else. But the quality here for recreational or responsible adult use didn't seem up to par to what I'm used to. And I tell you, that seems to be very consistent with what uh, my prediction was on it uh, when this debate came a, a couple of years ago. There was a fear, the uh, sort of uh, sky is falling approach that general adult consumption is going to drive medical out of business. And my approach or my belief was, well, not necessarily because cannabis is in fact a medicine. It has medicinal applications that may not be present in recreational use. And you've just pointed out one of the things that I think completely confirms that from your on the ground uh, view of it is that recreational is not as high quality as medicinal, duh, for the obvious reason yeah. that it's not intended to be a medicine. Yeah, and you would say that the grass is not always greener on the other side of the Rockies, eh? <laughs> I, I definitely would say that, although I, I will tell you, I got um, one of these little disposable vape pins um, <laughs> from that from okay. that recreational place. A burner vape pen. Pike Peak. We were up on Pike's Peak, and, um, and uh, you know, it's like a three-hour trip up to Pike's Peak at 14,000 feet elevation, and people were having problems breathing anyway. Right, that'll I get took you one little, I took one little draw off the vape pin because my back was hurting so badly, and I almost, almost fell over. <laughs> it makes a difference <laughs> when of, you're at 10,000 feet. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, we were at 14,000 feet, and, and I was looking at people next to me, and they had blue lips, and I was, yeah. like, I was worried a little bit. But, but you know, I was really, really, really high in Colorado. 
That's very good. In, in multiple ways, we like that. In multiple <laughs> ways, exactly. Yeah. Well, another thing so about the... So what do you guys got going on there? Well, Beach is going to go uh, through the national cannabis wrap-up. Oh, my goodness. So there's oh. just, just so much uh, wonderful news out there. You know that. And, and you know, the amazing thing is uh, a lot of the news is coming from Colorado. Now, I noticed that we're not getting a lot of news from Washington State. I wonder why that is. Or maybe it's all going to California and they're reprocessing it. Washington State has not formally uh, um, implemented its recreational mm-hmm. program. I think that's going to be later this year. Okay. Colorado has. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of uh, news, a lot of activity coming out of Colorado. Colorado is the very first uh, experimental laboratory in this uh, area with both recreational mm-hmm. and medicinal use on the ground happening Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of news coming out because it's the only one right now right right that's good that's very good uh uh, there's some interesting things in news like john paul stevens uh the uh uh, supreme court uh, justice john paul stevens believes that marijuana should be legalized by the federal government predicting that well yay for john yeah how about that i mean uh so you'll be surprised where people come out of the woodwork on this one and we have people on all sides of the aisle and uh, re-examining this and realizing this prohibition has to end. I think that's a, a very good point, and it's good that uh, a, a former Supreme Court justice has taken this public position. I think uh, it behind that is a realization that there is a changing mentality about it uh, throughout the political spectrum, and that would probably include all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, And as I may have alluded to earlier uh, in some of my prior appearances on this program, there is a legal theory by which the federal government could, in fact, be prevented from enforcing the Controlled Substances Act uh, as to the state's state's dealings with particularly medical cannabis. Uh, And I think this current makeup of the Supreme Court is very much primed to make a ruling in a case that is properly positioned with the proper state entity litigant making the proper arguments. Yeah. Isn't that See, and that's just it. They're, they're, it's not like there haven't been good arguments in the past. You, what you're saying, uh, Mark, is absolutely true. The proper case, the proper person that's taking it forward, and, and that, that knows their audience, it, it, all has to be, it all has to be choreographed and, and timed, and it has to be the proper case. It's, it just won't pass with it just won't pass with you know any case and, and anybody pushing it forward. Um, there are so many uh, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine in Washington that it does have to be the proper person bringing it forward. That yeah, it's um, good. Good facts make good law. Bad facts make bad law. That's a, a, a hoary legal maxim that uh, we're all taught uh, from the beginning of our law school careers, and and it's very true. In fact, uh, in addition to being very old, and that's what we have to have. We have to have the, uh, a really good set of facts um, uh, and a good uh, judicial body waiting to hear it, mm-hmm. ready and poised to make the ruling mm-hmm. that we and the country need them to make. Right. Yeah, and the great thing about that is that we have the process and we have the ability and uh, the the uh, movement is moving forward, and the authorities, the Justice Department, uh, the legal beagles, the legislative, the executive, they're all watching us, and they're listening, and they're learning, and uh, things are changing fast. So keep on Well, keep hopefully on. they're learning. They well, are learning. Uh, slowly, <laughs> and, and maybe not as quickly uh, and as soon as we'd like, because we would like this to have been uh, several years ago. Yes. You yeah, like 20. Right. <clears throat> Um, right. Yeah, so I mean, we we in, in in Colorado here, it just seems like I've talked to a, a, a bunch of people, and a, a lot of the residents, unless they're entrenched in the in the whole industry themselves, don't have a lot of idea about what's going on. You know, we ask the the normal person on the street, you know, where can we get recreational cannabis, and they would they just kind of looked at us like, uh, I'm not really sure. Go to that shop over on the corner there. And, and and it was basically, it was a medicinal shop, you know. And so just like the everyday layman really doesn't, you know, it's basically kind of like Las Vegas. If you, you're really not interested in it, you kind of hear it peripherally, and, and it doesn't make a lot of impact. 
But well, well, it's important uh, to get people educated on these things, even the ordinary person and even the person who may not consume cannabis either recreationally or medicinally. Um, and that's one of the, the good things about Weekend. Uh, look, its first two names are wellness education. Uh, you know, organizations like Weekend and other organizations locally and nationally uh, are, play an important role in bringing this educational component so that people who might not otherwise ever consume the product themselves see it for what it is, which is a medicinal product and the medicinal component and a far less harmful uh, compo uh, component in the recreational realm than, say, alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's true. And, there, you know, there's also a component here that, that um, I had not really considered before. I mean, I knew about it peripherally, but it just I really hadn't thought down and uh, sat down and considered it, is that um, one of my friends, he's an activist friend, um, he's helping patients. Uh, here in Colorado Springs and, you know, all, all the surrounding area, uh, he was telling me that there are people here that don't want to get their medicinal card because they are on government programs such as Section 8 or welfare or, or another type of government program that they live in fear of um, being taken off that program or denied any benefits that they've already got if they get a medicinal card here. And um, they're doing documentaries. Uh, they're doing some documentaries. I think one, was, one of them is called um, Illegally Healed. I think that was the tentative title. I like that. Um, and and <laughs> I, I talked to one of, his, one of his patients yesterday, and I talked to her about two, two and a half hours, and she was just telling me that the fear that she lived in before recreational, the fear that she lived in... Um, you know, of being thrown off these programs when she doesn't have, she's on disability, so she doesn't have a lot of resources otherwise. Well, and I just thought it was really interesting. Well, Jen, we're going to have to go to a break in just about a, a moment here, but we want you and Kurt okay. to stand by uh, so we can continue our live report from Colorado. But coming up after Jen, we're going to have a... Uh, 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 our other special guest, Mark's brother on, and uh, John, and he's going to give us a great report, hopefully, from uh, Michigan. So we're covering the nation. We can international radio. Indeed. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com This is our 420 Moment Weekend's 420 Moment. This is Mark Trebek presenting it today, and our celebrity 420 Moment involves the bard, William Shakespeare. Did no. William Shakespeare smoke weed? Well, that's an interesting question. There seems to be some anthropological support for that. Uh, several years ago, anthropologist Francis Thackeray, the director of the Institute for Human Evolution at the University of Witterwatersand in Johannesburg, suggested that William Shakespeare might have sought creative inspiration by smoking cannabis. Mm. Uh, a study conducted by Thackeray found 
marijuana residue in pipe fragments unearthed in Shakespeare's garden. Yeah, that's interesting. A little little further research uh, of Shakespeare's birthplace trust in Stratford on the Avon, England, allowed South African research scientists to to, uh, examine pipes and things that they found in Shakespeare's garden. He was a gardener. And uh, further, um, in some of his literature, he mentioned about uh, cannabis and about the weed and different things. Uh, even as this week in Las Vegas, we celebrated the 450th birthday last Wednesday of William Shakespeare uh, with, a, uh, with the production of Tempest. In his sonnet 76, which contains Shakespeare's reference to the noted weed and compound strange, compounds known in the early 1530s for the substance formed uh, these chemical unions, one or two ingredients of cannabis. So Shakespeare not only grew uh, hemp, which was common in his day, and, but he apparently smoked recreational marijuana. It didn't seem to affect his intelligence and his abilities at all. Indeed, it occurs to me that uh, some 2,600 words in the English language, many of them since gone out of use, have been credited to William Shakespeare. So the question is, doobie, is that one of the words that we can credit Mr. Shakespeare with? To do or not to doobie. To doobie or not to doobie. (laughs) Way to go, Bill. Today we salute you in our 420 moment. All righty. So uh, let's take this moment now to uh, introduce uh, our special guest, uh, John Terbeek from Michigan, a recent victor in the uh, landmark Michigan case of Terbeek versus City of Wyoming. He also happens to be my brother. Let me give you a little background on John. John, of course, in addition to being my brother, is the successful litigant in the landmark case just mentioned of Terbeek versus City of Wyoming. He has an excellent history, going all the way back to when uh, he was... uh, Busted in 1979 for crossing the state lines with 56 pounds of cannabis. Ooh, yes, indeed. He, he was ultimately pardoned by Jeb Bush oh while his brother sat in the White House for that. So uh, that uh, uh, incident has been properly and appropriately erased. But even despite that disability, he wound up becoming a lawyer, <laughs> becoming a lawyer in California, which is in one of the toughest of places that you can be a lawyer. And then going to Michigan and becoming a lawyer there before retiring and setting up his garden. Uh, the city of Wyoming, which uh, I also grew up in, is not what you would call the most progressive municipality in the world. And they decided that they were going to pass a zoning ordinance that was completely in conflict with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. John oh sued the city of Wyoming. At the trial court, uh, the local judge, um, I believe his name was Hack Hackerson, uh, John will be able to tell us his real name. Uh, but uh, he found uh, for the city of Wyoming, unsurprisingly, and on appeal, the first three appellate justices that heard this case voted three to nothing in John's favor. And then the next seven justices that heard the case of the Michigan Supreme Court also voted in John's favor. So, John, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. All right. So, great. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, uh, about some more of the uh, background uh, of the um, of your case, including some of the personalities involved. Well, you're probably pretty familiar with the uh, earliest uh, background of my case because <clears throat> you were the one that gave me the city of Anaheim cases and um, the uh, what uh, the Orange County case. I can't remember the name. Is about qualified patients ago. versus city of Anaheim? Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, and that spoke to. Uh, the uh, federal preemption of state law, which they uh, we we quoted those cases almost word for word about three <clears throat> three weeks after I filed the case, the uh, um, ACLU called me up and said, "Gee, can we get in on this?" And I said, "Sure, six heads are better than one." And uh, I was happy to uh, invite them onto the um, onto the team. And the, as you had just said, uh, this pinhead named Lieber, which was a uh, he's a, he's an idiot, probably shouldn't even be a judge. Um, 
he ruled against me at the circuit court level. The circuit court here is like the superior court out there. A, it's a trial court. And um, so we appealed that to the uh, Court of Appeals. We had one appeal as of right. And um, the uh, appellate justices ruled three to nothing in my favor, overturning Judge Pinhead's uh, um, <laughs> ruling against me. So the city of Wyoming um, appealed that from there to the Supreme Court. Apparently they didn't, didn't have enough rules. punishment. What? Apparently they just didn't have enough punishment. Yeah, that, that's right. So the Supreme Court uh, ruled seven to nothing in my favor, and um, and they explained that uh, um, there was no preemption because there's no conflict or ab- obstacle preemption because we don't require people to do it in Michigan, only if they want to. So, uh, I mean, it would have made it a whole lot easier if the federal government would have taken it off uh, uh, the first um, the uh, um, class one drug schedule one yes move it, move it to a class two well I guess this this speaks to something that's very important John you know a, a citizen such as yourself with a little bit of help as we worked this theory up using uh, some established precedents. We framed an issue, and then an advocacy organization, the ACLU, came in and uh, took it uh, took it all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, defending it. And as you said, six heads are better than one. Mm-hmm. But uh, the point that I take from this is that it takes somebody to start this. It takes somebody with fight and gumption to say no to an unjust situation. And it, it doesn't work every time, but in this case it worked. You did it. We did it. We made things happen. And then the ACLU jumped on board with its considerable resources and, uh, and really did the, the heavy uh, writing and lifting after that that, uh, that made, uh, helped make the, the case the success it was. Yeah, now, a, a lot of my friends said, aren't you worried about uh, the, uh, the cops coming in and raiding you? And I thought... Hey, I knew how to play the press, and I knew how to play the news. And I said, let them come in and, and bust me. And, uh, uh, of course, they didn't. And, and uh, I mean, it was a pretty easy victory because it doesn't get much easier than 7 to nothing. And uh, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I they mentioned <laughs> after that ruling that uh, they were going to think of other stuff to come up with other um, um, other ways to block you in their city ordinances, like zoning provisions, placing onerous burdens it. on so, people who want to uh, uh, grow their own, requiring uh, exorbitant electrical inspections, lighting yeah, requirements, yeah, that sort right. of thing. And uh, I, um, of course, I went up after the Supreme Court ruling came out in February. I went up to the next city council meeting basically to gloat. And uh, and I told them, you know, I really never never tire of kicking your butt. So if you want to do that, that's fine by me. I, I'll guarantee you I will file another suit. Now, the first time I told them I was going to file a suit, back in 2010, they scoffed at me and laughed at me. Nobody was laughing after uh, I won the Supreme Court ruling. You know, there's an interesting uh, personal note to this, too, is that uh, the mayor of the city of Wyoming is Jack Paul, and he was uh, the son of a longtime friends of our parents. We, we come from a community that, that hung together and hangs together, uh, and uh, they were part of what uh, the parents called the Crazy Eights. The Pauls were part of the Crazy Eights. Jack Paul was the son. He taught me at Sunday school. Jack Paul, the mayor that that did this uh, uh, harebrained approach to try to ban medical cannabis was actually my Sunday school teacher for yeah, one year Bob, when I was a young I boy. Like Bob, I like Bob Paul. I still do. You know, and uh, Bob Paul's a great guy. His, his, his son is misguided. Guy. Jack Paul's a moron, <laughs> and he was taking directions from the church. I don't know if he's ever heard of the separation of church and state, but he sure didn't act like it. Now, when I went up there to gloat, 
on my Supreme Court victory, I got to tell you, the entire city council looked at me, and they looked like they just ate a turd. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mm. bet you they did, and I, and I wish I could have gotten a picture of the expression on their faces. Turning yeah, to they didn't scoff that time. Yeah. You know, I said, you do that, I'll... I never tire of kicking your butts. I'll be right back up here filing another suit. Now, turning to another uh, aspect of Michigan's uh, cannabis uh, crusade, uh, I uh, understand that the Michigan House has just passed uh, a bill that sets up a statewide regulatory program for provisioning centers. Yeah, and number 4271. 4271. Now, I looked at that bill, and on its face it seems to be uh, a step in the right direction. I think it's something that the legislature... Um, may have done uh, in specific recognition of your court case because they realized, given what the Supreme Court said, we can't simply have this uh, situation hang unregulated. The Supreme Court has spoken. Mr. Drabik has finally established the right of all Michiganders to uh, grow their own medicinal cannabis. Uh, but do you have some concerns about this law? Yes, I do have. Uh, Any time the government gets involved, I worry. Um, they said that it's okay to go ahead and set up um, um, ordinances, uh, speaking of zoning and planning and stuff like that. Now, I uh, I kind of worried about that because, you know, what they're going to wind up coming out is with is uh, like porn shops. You can only set it up in certain parts of the. Um, within 500 feet of the school, in a small uh, community like Godfrey Lee, which I live in, there is no place that's more than 500 feet from the school. So um, one, one of their concerns when they first talked about the original ordinance was, oh, we just don't want people dispensing. It should be a pharmacist that dispenses it, which Jack Paul, the mayor, also is a pharmacist. And so I he wanted in on the gravy. This, what I wanted to tell him was, I've been dispensing this stuff for 40 years, you know, <laughs> and um, you can't stop me. And uh, they'd rather dispense the stuff that'll kill your liver and kill your kidneys. And, um, and I, I don't think that anybody even knows why they don't like marijuana. Anybody from the ruling class, they haven't, they've never heard the story about William Randolph Hearst being in competition with hemp paper, because he had interest in the paper. Uh, uh, Hearst had interest in the paper. Paper uh, pulp for his papers, and hemp, yes. was com- uh, hemp was a competitor. Yeah, and they were a competitor. Wasn't was DuPont also in that? Who? The DuPont family? Well, there are a number of different uh, entities that were uh, engaged in this issue. There were oil interests, there were compounding interests, there were textile interests, there were uh, textile makers. Uh, well, how, how Hearst got this is he also had known this yellow journalistic rag called the San Francisco Chronicle, and he prints stories about how black people would be using the evil drug, marijuana, and that... uh, Throwing a little racism into the debate. Yeah, throw a little racism. They'd rape white women and uh, all this kind of crap, and people were stupid enough to believe it. So... Well, it's interesting that uh, propaganda can, in fact, make even somewhat intelligent people believe completely ridiculous things. But back to Michigan's medical marijuana law, at least with respect to the provisioning centers, it does have a specific uh, provision in it protecting the rights granted under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Now, your Supreme Court case defined those rights clearly. So in, in legalese, we call that a savings clause. What's your concern about this savings clause, about uh, how the, the uh, savings clause can be gotten around? Well, it's like I said, they, they uh, may actually um, say that you can only grow it in certain spots and wind up treating it like a porno shop where you can't, you know, can't, you can't grow it just anywhere. Is your, is your concern that, they'll, that they would effectively define anybody who grew it as a provisioning center or a provisioning entity? Yeah, and uh, yes. And, uh, 
Well, that's one of them. I think it's like we had talked about. It could be like a Trojan horse type effect. Uh, but uh, it's like I when I first filed this suit, I, like I told my friends, I said, I'm going to do it whether they like it or not, you know. And um, it's ne- the law has never stopped me. I think it's a stupid law. But if they want to go on... You're talking about the Michigan ordinance, the, the stupid law being the Michigan ordinance. Well, the, the federal ordinance. Oh, you mean the Controlled Substances Act, yes. Yeah, the CSA, that's right. And um, I thought that uh, somebody's got to do it. And, and as I had told my many friends that told me I should really be worried, I said, hey, I'm... Six, you know, 60 years old or whatever, I, if they want to bust me for it, they can go ahead and bust me. I'm not looking for my first job, and I'm not worried about putting this down on the job app. And um, I, will, uh, I will go ahead. I'll move forward on it, and um, they can go stuff it. If they don't like it. Well, so, John, um, John, let me ask you this: um, You've uh, been a litigant in a successful Supreme Court case, but and, and you've helped to find the rights of people. What do you think of the general concept of um, good faith legislation that seeks to uh, permit uh, dispensaries or provisioning centers in Michigan that are subject to uh, reasonable regulations? Well, I think it's about time they. They, the reason why they didn't include that with the original, um, the original initiative, was because they were afraid that people, people out here look, looked at commercials like, oh, they had commercials out here, and I was living in California at the time, but so I have heard that people saw commercials where other people would stumble out was smoke blowing out after him right next door to a school or or uh, a church and uh the classic propaganda yeah it's classic propaganda and um <clears throat> fortunately for us the uh initiative came at the exact same election that uh, this uh, this uh what, what do you call it when you have a spinal thing, uh, what do you call that, Al? An epidural or spinal tap? No, not, it, it's, uh, when you take a baby and, and uh, they abort it and take their DNA. Oh, their, yes, uh, stem cells, stem cell stem research. Cell research. Yeah, stem cell research. It came at the same time, so all the churches put all their energy into stopping that, and they ignored the marijuana thing. And otherwise, I don't know if it would have ever passed in Michigan. I see. So there was a happenstance of political fortune and that a even more hot-button uh, social issue that riled the social conservatives was on the ballot, uh, yeah. took all the energy out of the room, and allowed uh, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Initiative to pass. That's correct. So uh, um, anyway, uh, that... That uh, was one of the, I think, uh, precipitating factors on uh, having the medical marijuana thing pass. So, um, but I spoke in front of the uh, hash bash a couple of few weeks ago, earlier this month. There was 8,000 people there, and uh, I told them about how I basically squashed the city of Wyoming like a bug. And they all cheered. Well, that sounds like a good moment uh, for the people at the Hash Bash to hear about a, a victory. Uh, any victory is a good victory in this movement, and the more we pile them up, the more momentum we have. Uh, so we're about ready to come up. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, John, we're going to come back to you uh, in, in a moment. Uh, we're going to take a break shortly, and then after our break, we're, we'll come right back uh, to the Cannabis News Hour. Did you know that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications? 
yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet, we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119, 702-388-1119, or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuananow.com. Thank you. Weekend 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at Weekend 702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash weekend 702 our website is www.wecan702.org be a part of the nevada cannabis reform revolution please join us and donate today this is mark trebeek filling in while mike mcauliffe is on hiatus filling in for mr mcauliffe along with beach and Jennifer Solis calling in from Colorado. We're glad to have you all here today. We've been speaking with John Terbeek, uh, talking about uh, a notable citizen victory in Terbeek versus the city of Wyoming. Uh, John, I want to get your comments on uh, an aspect of this bill that I particularly like. Uh, I got to tell you, I've been looking through this, and it really is incorporating a lot of concepts that the Nevada law has in it, including specifically the concept of reciprocity, that is, out-of-state qualifying patients being able to obtain product in-state. What what do you think of the concept of reciprocity in that regard? Well, I like the the concept of reciprocity, but uh, here's what worries me, is if there's state-run dispensaries, the quality of the marijuana is not going to be nearly as good as what you have in your... uh, your uh, little mom and pop grow rooms, you know. So, um, I agree, John. I, I've seen that here in Colorado. I, I I went into the shop all giddy, thinking I was going to get some great blast, you know, some great stuff, and my pain was going to go away, and it was going to be better than mine. And walked in there, and then walked out disappointed. Yes, and and not only that, um, um, the. Uh, the uh, quality, they're going to probably put a, a handle on it, like uh, a ceiling. You can't have anything above a... Uh, X amount of THC, Delta 9 THC, can't have any more than 5 milligrams of Delta 9 THC in a particular serving. I get, I get that. that that's, that's conceivable. I don't see anything in this bill about that. And what I like about the bill, uh, leaving aside any potential for a Trojan horse uh, ability to shut down uh, individuals growing on their own behalf or for uh, as p- primary caregivers for others is this concept that it, it seems to be, it, it seems to fit uh, a long line of state regulations that are coming in to being since even before the coal memo, which set up this robust statewide regulatory system uh, that uh, makes the federal government back off from a policy standpoint. Uh, John, uh, you, do you remember the, the Cole Memo when it came out in August of last year? Was that mu- much of a buzz in Michigan? No, it really hardly made a sound. My, my case seemed to make the most noise. Oh, and uh, what was I going to tell you? Um, oh, yeah, the, the government also said that uh, Bill 4271, or uh, for, uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, Bill forty forty two yeah seventy one was patient friendly. Anytime they categorize something as patient friendly, I've got to look at them with a really weary eye. Do you think the governor is going to sign or veto this bill if it gets passed? Well, I don't know if it'll be vetoed or not. We have a governor that's not very friendly toward marijuana, 
and um, I'm I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out. It, it's still sitting on the Senate floor. It's you, past the House, but it's still sitting on the Senate floor. So I'm going to have to try to, um, you know, um, see where people stand on. I don't I don't know how the rest of this country is standing on my Supreme Court victory. I haven't shepherdized it yet. But I'm sure that in due time, it will be cited all over the country. So, because um, little towns, they try to have their own little ordinances that basically run, try to run the marijuana people out of town. And um, I don't think that that would very much suit what I'm trying to do. So that that was the case in in my lawsuit at first with one county when judge Penn had um ruled against me and then uh, after the appellate court ruled for in my favor that affected 16 counties and now when the supreme court ruled in my favor it affected the whole state so what they did was they opened up a can of worms the city of wyoming and and um I've said this many times, I I don't really blame the city attorney for it. He's a friend of mine. I've worked with him on many cases. Um, but he was only doing what those incompetent, bumbling fools told him to do. So, um, and that's the exact way I quoted, was quoted in the newspaper is, is uh, called the uh, mayor and the city council incompetent bumbling fools well they certainly didn't come up with a particularly compelling legal argument in it considering that 10 appellate justices out of 10 appellate justices found in your favor yeah i mean you know Absolutely. if it was a two to one split at the at the initial appellate level and a and a four to three split at the other end you you, you might have been able to say well you know that was a close call and there were some valid legal arguments made by the forces for prohibition but but when it's ten to nothing nah i don't think so yeah, yeah that, that's true it was a, it is an easy call and they haven't they haven't tried to bring it to the federal court but uh they knew they'd lose anyway. I think they. At the federal level. I don't think they can bring it to the federal court. This is one of those issues that's an entirely one of state law, and uh, it's a uh, it's not a justiciable issue uh, in the federal court system. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. We can well, keep it out of the federal court system. That's we want to keep our rights out of the federal courts. By the way, the federal yeah. courts are not our friends when no, it comes no, to rights. None of the courts are are very friendly toward towards us. Uh, I will have to say that I was pleasantly surprised by the uh, Michigan Appellate Court and the Michigan Supreme Court for ruling in my favor. But the only way I think that the federal court uh, that the uh, federal courts could have got their mitts on it was by um, stating that uh, well, this is a, a preemption issue. That is a federal question, you know. So. Um, but it's, you know, the, there's always the Tenth Amendment, and um, that they, we have the right to all our <coughs> medical decisions, <coughs> and um, all, all the medical is left up to the states. That's the big uh, <laughs> issue that uh, I have actually been uh, making some level of discussion happen out here and in other places is that 10th mm -hmm. amendment you you just mentioned it and i think that's what distinguishes medical from uh, a general adult consumption it's the concept that under the 10th amendment a state has a compelling interest in the health safety and welfare of its citizens mm -hmm. and and uh, under the 10th amendment the state as its own sovereign the state in and of itself has standing to actually sue the federal government, whereas the citizens of the state don't. And the state can, in fact, so powerful is this Tenth Amendment argument, it won't be done, but so powerful is this Tenth Amendment argument that states can actually initiate a lawsuit in the Supreme Court of the United States, yep. making it a trial court. 
Now, they wouldn't do that because the Supreme Court would be looking like, why did you initiate this in front of us? We want you to develop a record. And they wouldn't like the plaintiff for doing that. So the political thing is to start it in the district court, work it up to the Circuit Court of Appeal, and then bring it to the, the United States Supreme Court. But the point of that is, is that there are very, very few issues that can be litigated making the United States Supreme Court a trial court and a state's Tenth Amendment right to uh, act in furtherance of its citizens' health and welfare is one of those. And I think that's what came, what, what uh, produced the Cole Memo, uh, because as these issues are coming out and these states are beginning to enact their own comprehensive, robust regulatory schemes that uh, satisfy all the elements of a state sovereign acting as such, the federal government realized that we don't want this we don't want this issue to get in front of the United States Supreme Court because it's ripe for a federal government defeat. So rather than have a formal loss at the hands of the United States Supreme Court, uh, the federal government and the policy, the people behind Obama, um, as disappointing as he may, he may be on any number of other issues, mm -hmm. are actually uh, getting it on this issue. It, it's, this is a loser a potential loser for the federal government, and we want to make the federal government understand that and let them know and let our states know that they want to defend, they need to defend their regulatory systems. Right. Yeah, and one of the things that our audience may not know is that uh, certain states have a certain amount of power concerning the law such as California, Michigan. These are bigger states that actually set precedents uh, and that the courts listen to and watch because uh, when I was a young politician, I started out my pre-law training at the University of Michigan. And uh, that was one of the principles I learned is that some states have a lot more power, so they have to be very careful at challenging some of these states. What I like about Nevada, bringing it around to uh, uh, our local environment here, is that, in fact, given the... the confluence of circumstances in Nevada. Nevada has a, a real chance to take the lead on this one. The, the economic basis for the industry that's going to be created out here this year and the next year and the following years, the tourism that is going to uh, develop around Nevada's reciprocity uh, element of its law is, is going to make Nevada a leader on this one, and I certainly hope that its po uh, political uh, apparatus does what it needs to do. Yeah. Well, well, I'll tell you when uh, when Michigan passed theirs, they were the uh, 16th state to ha allow medical marijuana. There are now 20 or 21, I believe. 21 and, now. Um, so 22. It's, it's a growing 22. 22, yes. Uh, 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 because that would include the states that are doing uh, CBD mm -hmm. variants right. uh, that uh, don't allow uh, Delta 9 THC psychoactive components, but are doing uh, like CBDs. Like Utah, like uh, um, uh, some of the southern states. Mm. I think it was Texas or something crazy. I know it's Utah. Uh, That's the one that's closest to us. You want to hear a crazy one? Even Wisconsin, old Mr. Walker is even interested in this. Well, uh, oh, it I sounds like we're, we're about to the end I think here. that wraps it up for another weekend Cannabis News Hour. Yeah, we're glad to have you, and see you on First Friday. Thank you for all our guests. Right, thank you, and you don't guys let have a great go. day.